Hello everybody and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic, awaiting well, and today I'll be doing a breakdown of my breakdown. I know, a little meta there. Before going any further though, please make sure you smash that like button, light up that fire button if you're watching over on Odyssey, smash the rumble button, and also make sure you're subscribed to the channel with the bell notification turned on, that way you know every time a new video or live stream goes live on the channel. So something that a lot of people have asked for me to do is to kind of break down my methodology to explain my chart, and I've done this in previous videos. Now that I've been on YouTube now for a few years, uh, in the very beginning especially, I was breaking down my methodology, and I guess I'll give a little bit of an origin story of what eventually became this uh, insanely uh, convoluted or at least seemingly convoluted chart uh, that exists right here starting all the way back with Joker uh, which again it's kind of insane to think that I've been doing this for as long as I have but let's go ahead and it just kind of go into it for a second so when I first started doing YouTube one of the things that I started to cover first was John just Star Wars news but also the box office when it came to solo a Star Wars story and so one of the things that I decided to look into was hey is this film actually going to make any money or not? So I started doing research into, okay, how much money do studios typically make off of their releases? How much do they keep? How much do they split with the movie theaters? You know, what are some of the breakdowns there? And what I discovered was that there was a pretty common uh, theme amongst many prosecutors as far as the box office goes that typically studios will keep roughly around 60% of their box office by the end of their run. So if a film made $100 million, at the end of its run, right in the total box office run that it had, the studio would keep about $60 million of that, whereas the $40 million, uh, the rest of it would go to the theaters in some form or fashion, or at least through the process of release. Also, having worked in a movie theater, I knew that there was at least some truth to this because that I knew just based on ticket sales and based on questions that I would ask as a supervisor at my own local AMC back in the day that, uh, you know, I asked the questions of, you know, well, how much money do we actually get as a theater and how much of the money goes to the studios? And basically, uh, the general manager, you know, I would talk to would always break it down to say that we typically get a dollar for every $10 spent on a ticket, meaning that studios typically get about 90%, usually in the first two weeks, because those are the deals that are usually, um, you know, worked out as far as the distributors and also with the theaters themselves. And it makes sense because... Theaters obviously want to have as many people as possible in their theater to sell popcorn and stuff. That's why popcorn and soft drinks are always, you know, crazily priced. As again, my uh, my dogs, my hounds are definitely showing the displeasure there over the fact that we have to spend as much money as we do on all of these different products. But it is something that also makes sense, right? So if a studio gets the vast majority of tickets in the first couple of weeks, it makes sense as to why a theater would have to charge as much as they do for those types of things because they got to keep things running there and they're barely getting anything off tickets. The reason why it's the first two weeks is because that is typically when the most people go to see a movie. And so after those first two weeks, a studio is much more willing to take less cut on their investment. And so over time, the, uh, the, the cut from the studio becomes a lot less over time. And obviously, you also take into account the fact that when they release their movies in foreign countries, the take is roughly roughly around usually 40% or so in some places like China. It's 25% of a cut that the studios actually get uh, return on investment. And so with all of that taken into account, the end result is going to be somewhere around 60% or so. Now, I know that there's a lot of different people who might have some different metrics out there. But the issue is, is that sometimes we fall into, and I fall into this myself, where we say that this is a hard line, right? That this is exactly the amount of money that a movie made, or this is the, exactly the amount of money that a movie lost. But something that I always try and do as best as I can during videos is to say, this is right now the perceived, or this is the most likely outcome. This is the most likely profit or the most likely net loss that a film is actually dealing with. And if you're wondering how I'm able to continue to focus on this conversation with the hounds just going crazy in the background i sometimes wonder myself as river and willow again are just some of the most ridiculous hounds that i love still uh, in the entire world but with that being said it again makes sense as to why when i when i again when i point out that it's the most likely outcome what i mean is that based off the numbers that are being reported based off of what the information that we have available this is most likely the profit or this is most likely the loss of any given movie and so that is where we get that end result number from so in my chart Let's go to my chart. Uh, when I have, for instance, this uh, you know projected loss or gain, what I'm doing is I'm taking the total box office number, 
right? And then I'm taking 60% of that number, which is, again, the cut by the end of its run that a studio would actually get on its investment. And then I am subtracting the total cost of the movie itself, which would include not just the budget, but also the marketing cost. And that's something that oftentimes people don't quite understand. So marketing specifically, kind of going into this category a little bit, is normally 1.5 times, or rather you take the budget, multiply it by 1.5, and that gives you the typical total cost of a movie, including marketing. Normally, the, the old adage is take 50% of the budget, add that on top of the budget, and that's about as much money as is spent on marketing or the total amount of money spent with marketing. And so if a film costs $40 million, typically a studio will spend about $20 million on marketing. And obviously, the higher budget the film is, the more money that is spent on marketing. And again, these are just standards, which means that some films can spend more on marketing, some films can spend less on marketing, and so that's why there is a fluctuation here, which is why when you have a film that has a huge financial loss attached to it, it really is hard to argue that the film has any chance of being viable or any chance of being successful, whereas when you have a film that gets very close to its break-even number, there is an argument to be made that the film will likely have made return on its investment through some other means, but that's also one of the reasons why, if you even go to my website, I point this out. I say these numbers, and again, this is under the Star Wars box office section, these numbers are all based on reported budgets without incentives added or potential extra costs, meaning I just take the numbers that are being reported from the box office, what are being reported from the studio as far as the actual cost of the film, and I'm not taking into account any of those extra deals, right? So sometimes you have studios that will get tax incentives. Sometimes you will get studios that have different kind of marketing campaigns where they're not spending as much. All of these different factors, though, become such a spider web of incentives or losses, right, extra costs, that it's impossible to truly calculate that. That's why some people have tried to say, well, you're not accounting for the HBO Max numbers. You're not accounting for this. Yes, you're right. I'm not accounting for those things because those things are impossible to be able to actually have a good metric for or to have a actual you know, an actual legitimate source that we can verify and we can actually add and we can actually follow in any foreseeable way or any uh, clear way whatsoever. The only numbers that we can do that with are the budgets that are reported, the likely marketing cost, because again, the standard that is set, and again, you can go ahead and look this up for yourself, right? The standard is typically half of the budget added on, and then also the typical cut that a movie studio will get by the end of its theatrical run. So all of these things are having to be taken into account because these are the only numbers that we really have as far as any type of verifiable third-party verification method, whereas all of those extra costs or extra incentives can't really be truly calculated, and so therefore bear no uh, impact on the way that I do charting because to me, it's just kind of a losing game there because if we can you know we can play the what if and what about this until we're blue in the face and we're just going to be left confused not knowing exactly how well or how not well a film did in the end so as this goes on to say marketing budget is assumed to be typical so budget times 1.5 in all cases to calculate actual gain or loss worldwide total box office has the projected total cost subtracted from it after it has been multiplied by 0.6 because that's taking 60 percent of the end result Again, because they get about 60% of the box office. So determine the numbers for inflation. All numbers were entered into it. So again, when it comes to older films, I will every now and then run these numbers through an inflation calculator and show you what it would be like in today's terms. And so here I break down actually all of the Star Wars films as far as how much they entirely cost, how much they made in their theatrical runs. And it's a pretty interesting, um, a pretty interesting metric to say the very least. In fact, it goes through the profit, the net gain, net profits that these films made throughout their runs. And obviously the original trilogy was actually the, you know, vastly much more profitable franchise, but I digress just a little bit there. So going into, I guess, that for a little bit as far as net gain, net profit. So again, if we take the amount of money that a film is going to cost and then subtract it from what is currently available times 0.6, right, taking 60% of it, that is what gets us this number here. So that's why some people say, but wait a minute, you know, that means it just needs to make $45 million to break even. Well, no, this is only after you take into account that this is only, you know, you only get 60%, the studio only gets 60% of this number, and then you subtract the total amount of money cost. And so that's what gets this number here. So it actually has to make a lot more than 45 million and to make this number back because it only gets 60% of whatever number it ends up getting from that. So that's why it's probably closer to around, you know, $80 million or so that needs to make in order to reach that number, which for that movie, <laughs> Resident Evil, <laughs> Welcome to Raccoon City is not actually likely. So then others might ask, you know, where do I get the break even 
number from. And so this is, again, using similar metrics as I had mentioned before. Of, okay, let's assume that the movie needs to, again, make 60% of its money back right? Or rather that the studio only gets 60% of the entirety of the cost. So we take then the total cost. So in this case, this is actually a perfect example. This film with marketing costs $60 million. Again, 40 million times 1.5 is 60 million. So let's assume then that this film, right, needs to then make a certain amount of money to make its money back because studios only get about 60% of the box office. Okay. That would mean that the film would need to make $100 million because 60% of that would be $60 million, which would be the exact amount of money that they spent on the film. So that is where this break even number comes from. And I do that for all of these other films. And so again, if you do the math for yourself, you can see why these numbers are the way that they are. So again, this is assuming, right, this number here, right, the total cost with marketing, with typical marketing cost, and then taking into account that the studio gets 60% of the box office. Okay, what is then 60% of this number here? And that gives us an idea of how much money, rather what's 60% needed to get to this number here. And then you can do the reverse math on that to figure out how much money is needed because this number here is 60% of this number here, right? And so those are where those numbers come from as such. So the other thing to talk about, the last thing to talk about would be the minimum projections that I have in this charting. And so this is something that I actually just figured out on, on my own. And so one of the things that I did when I was following solo, a star Wars story was I said, Hmm, how much money uh, is typically made in the first couple weeks of release? Is there a good metric? You know, we always talk about week one to week two drop off because it's an indication of whether a film has legs or not. And so I decided to look into uh, going back into news articles, going back into reports of uh, movie releases and started to figure out, OK, let me go ahead and compare the first two weeks of release to some other films. And so I started off with Star Wars films and then I even went back to some other big budget films. And what I found was that typically films make somewhere between 50% of its entire box office in the first two weeks or as little as 70% in the first two weeks. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that let's say that we go to the entire end of a theatrical run and then we compare that to the first two weeks. The first two weeks would compose either 70% right? Minimum, right? Meaning like the smallest amount of money that could possibly be made. Like, so basically saying there that the vast majority of its money was made in the first two weeks, meaning it made nothing down the line, or it was actually even able to double the amount of money it made in the first two weeks. And that is typically the range that I found on most films, especially big budget films. And because of that metric, I decided, hey, this seems to be, since there's consistency here with a lot of other big budget films, especially within Star Wars and other big budget projects, and again, there's older videos where I actually show you the movies that I use to kind of come up with this analysis myself, and I said, okay, let's go ahead and use this then as a metric of a max projection and a minimum projection. So again, these are still projections, and there are films that fall outside of this category, right? There's films that actually go into the, the 40s or 30s for percentage, meaning that they make a ton more money in the end of its run because of crazy legs, or they that the number is even higher than 70% in the first two weeks, meaning the film makes nothing or next to nothing in the weeks that follow its initial release. And so that's where I get my projections from. And then that's directly connected to the minimum loss and gain, because assuming those are the end results, you then are able to subtract the money after taking the 60% cut from the box office. And that gets you the either total loss or total gain of any given film. And so uh, if you actually even look to the chart I have, I actually give you the percentage of the first two weeks compared to the end results, or at least the current end result. So as you can see, a lot of the films that are currently being posted are hovering close to the 70s, 80s, right? And some films like No Time to Die actually did better, right? 45%, The Last Duel actually did better, even though it was a financial loss at 45%. Halloween Kills 70%. Uh, many Saints of Newark, I was not able to really keep up with because it kind of left theaters pretty quickly. As Family 2 did a lot better. But as you can see, a lot of films typically are hovering in that 50 to 70% range. And in fact, I have a running tally. And right now, the all around average is around 61%, which is the average that I have for my projections as well. And so even though, right, I was able to figure this out years ago, and it's obviously not always going to be perfect, you do find that when it comes to the average, my average is actually damn near close to what the entirety of the average is for the, you know, all films in general. So again, I just thought that this was a pretty interesting breakdown. And I know that I had a lot of questions as far as to how my box office breakdowns actually work and where my charting comes from. So if you want to do and follow this along yourself, you can go, of course, to my website, OMBreviews.com and look at the box office tracking there. And hopefully this made a little bit more sense. Obviously, there's gonna be people out there saying, no, math, it's too early for math. 
and I totally understand. But anyway, what are your thoughts about this? Let me know in the comment section below. If this video, smash that like button, smash the rumble button, light up the fire button. You're all amazing, beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. As always, God bless. And now for a huge shout out to all of my December Patreon subscribe star and locals members, animation commentator, Brandon, Brian P, Christopher Bowman, Dolores Ed, Dion, Father Christopher Miller, hail to you father, Father Damien Cook, Garrett Searles, Hannibal Grimm, Harold Francis, Inflamed Wood, Jacob Juice, Jeff Toon, Joe Horn, Jonathan Carney, Gomer Kyle 79, Laura, the Modern Major General's Story, Mike Jackson times four, Mitch Dunaway, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mr. Peabody, Mondo Spieler, On to June, Orin Chat Reviews, Out of Step with Reality, Priscilla Hall, Rosetta Allen, Stan Andrian, Teresa Martin, Theodore Benden, and Tina Bojan, and of course, the Empress of the Universe. Tina B, thank you very much for being my Patreon members. And for my subscribe star members, UAB Mad Dog, Max Mike Jackson, Storm Tracker, The R, Fast Reaction, Nosferatu Gatsu, Stan 4, John B, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., Dean Heiss, slash the new number two. J-Rod, the beer guru, and ZK Man. Thank you very much for supporting me on Subscribestar and to my four members over on Locals.com, Kara Tharp, UAB Mad Dog, once again, Mike Jackson, Biffer the Hobbit, and Robert Barnes. Thank you for supporting me on Locals. And if you want to have your name shouted out at the end of every video and live stream, check out the top link in the video description below. It's called Willow or dot W dot L O Willow link. It'll bring you to all of my social media platforms and also to all of the various other locations that you can support the channel. You can get access to things like giveaways where I do giveaways of 4K films, 4K steelbooks, digital codes, all kinds of stuff every single month. All also, there is a level where you get access to all of that, plus an exclusive podcast that I do with John the Flick Pick Flickinger, where you also get to ask questions that we will answer on every episode of the podcast. And at the final level, you also have the ability, the chosen of Valhalla level, you have the ability to have all of that, plus in your first month, get a free t-shirt of your choice, any color sent anywhere in the world, and also you get to be featured once a month on the chosen of Valhalla live stream featured on the main channel. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, check out the link in the description. You're all amazing and beautiful people. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless.